our How to Successfully Litigate a Personal Injury Case Series, Part Cinco. Today's Cinco de Mayo, we're up to part five. Um, today's, today, Andrew's gonna cover pre-trial disclosures and gearing up for trial. And before we get going, we're gonna do some thanks to our sponsors. These are the folks that are putting the bill, making it free for all of you to attend. Um, we hope that you will listen to their messages and even more importantly, use their services should you find yourself in need. My name is Elizabeth Bonina, and I've been a neutral at National Arbitration and Mediation since 2007. Prior to joining NAM, I served as a Justice of the Supreme Court in Kings County and as a judge in other courts during my 16-year judicial career. Here at NAM, I hear arbitrations and mediations in all types of personal injury and medical malpractice claims, both virtually and in person. I hope to see you at NAM sometime soon and enjoy the presentation. Hi, I'm Joseph with Physician Life Care Planning. Our medical cost assessment, or what some of our clients have called a mini life care plan, is a physician authored discovery tool that provides a credible, objective substantiation of future medical damages for your client. At $2,450, it is ideal for when you are pre suit and working towards settlement or when you are working a case with lower policy limits. Please contact me if you'd like more information about our MCA. Thank you. Hello, my name is Kevin Connolly. I'm a partner with Albany Investigation and Process Services based in Albany, New York. We perform investigative services for law firms throughout the upstate New York area. We also perform the service of legal process. We have over 30 years of investigative experience. Please feel free to visit our website at albanyinvestigation.com. We look forward to working with you at Albany Investigation and Process Services. so much to all of our sponsors again making it possible for us to do all of this phenomenal CLEing for all of you for free. I'm going to turn it over to the amazing Andrew Smiley. Andrew is the lead trial attorney at Smiley and Smiley where his practice focuses on significant personal injury, med mal, and wrongful death. He's a Brooklyn Law School graduate just like me and he served as the Academy's president in 2017 and 2018. He is also a past president and board member of the New York City Trial Lawyers Alliance, and he hosts my favorite podcast, The Mentor ESQ. All right, Andrew, it is all yours, my friend. Thank you, Michelle. It's great to have everybody back for part five. Thank you so much uh, for joining me. Looking forward. We're, you should be getting excited. We're getting closer to trial. We are at the gear up for trial phase. And as usual, I have enclosed materials that I hope will be helpful to you. I'll sort of shout them out as I go through it, uh, but I will not screen share my materials because time goes so fast that I want to use it all to chat with you and not look at documents. But I've enclosed materials from uh, that I'll be referencing and you're free to use them as you would like. I've tried to redact all the personal information out there. If I miss something, uh, obviously please do not disclose it, uh, but I hopefully did not miss anything. Uh, many of you are asking questions about uh, catching episodes or parts one through four. And the reason I said episodes is because uh, some of you are listening uh, to this through my podcast, The Mentor ESQ, uh, while others are attending it through the Academy's live CLE webinar. So you can catch uh, parts one through four at the mentoresq.com uh, website. Uh, we just relaunched it actually this week. It's really easy to find all the episodes uh, from this series as well as others I've done with the New York State Academy of Trial Lawyers. That will give you free CLE credit. Credit. You can listen to it as an audio. You can go to the website and um, watch a video if you like the visual. And then you can submit forms uh, that are right there through a link and get your credits, either one credit or one and a half, depending on what's there. So you can check it all out. Uh, if you need materials, you can email the Academy. You could also email me. My email information is on my backdrop here as well. And uh, I will get the materials to you from the different uh, episodes and parts of the CLE. So let's get to it. And again, I would like to preface this, uh, this CLE as I do all of them that there's no way I can cover in an hour everything that goes into, you know, gearing up for trial, pretrial disclosures and all of that. Um, so I try and touch on what I think is really important 
Again, this whole series is my playbook, how I approach things. And if you just take one or two things from this uh, CLE, this hour or hour and a half, if you stay on for the Q&A, uh, which I hope you do, um, then it's worth it, right? You pick up something new. A lot of, I'm hearing from a lot of attorneys, some thanking me for learning new information, others who have been doing this as long as I have, sometimes longer saying, thanks for reaffirming uh, that what I'm doing is right or uh, still picking up new tricks. We're always learning as lawyers. I'm certainly learning every day. And I would also like to ask everyone to contribute. This is interactive. I don't know everything by any means. I know what I know and I know what I don't know. So I share what I do know. If you know more or you can contribute in a topic that I'll be covering throughout this CLE, drop it in the Q&A chat. Um, put in whatever suggestions you have. Uh, we like to use that as sort of a forum to not only post questions, but to give suggestions and commentary. So please feel free to use that. Uh, we get a lot of interaction that way. So let's get to it. Gearing up for trial. So there's kind of two different ways of gearing up for trial. Obviously, you're always the proper way to prepare a case from the moment you sign it up and open it is with your sights on trial. You're always thinking about the trial when you're building up a case. You know, what evidence are you going to need to prove a prima facie case or to prove a defense? Um, you know, you start thinking about your opening statements and your witnesses and all of that ties into how you litigate your case through uh, your demands, your discovery, the, the depositions, what you ask, who you question. And so you're always thinking about it. So you're always in essence gearing up for trial, but then really once you certify that you're ready for trial. So in state court, at least here in New York, it's a certification or it's a filing of a note of issue that gets you on track for a trial date that's when the slow, serious gear up for trial when you're seeing this case may have to be tried should begin. And so I'll call that this, the, the slow gear up. Um, then there's the fast gear up. The fast gear up is you show up for a pretrial conference, you're begging for more time, you think you might get more time, your adversary may think they're getting more time and you're being told, yep, come back in two weeks, you're picking, you're going. Or they may tell you, come back tomorrow, you're picking, you're going. Uh, and that's the get your act together, now gear up time. So we're gonna talk about how you handle that as well. Um, both of them are exciting times. Uh, there's a lot of nervousness that goes into it, excitement, anxiety, everybody processes uh, an upcoming trial in different ways. So, um, you know, we can talk about that as well, but one of the best ways to channel that energy that you have when you know a case is coming up for trial is to be prepared. You've heard me say this every part, I think, in this series, preparation, preparation, preparation. That's what we do to be excellent attorneys. We prepare everything. So let's talk about sort of the early phases of gearing up for trial. And with that, I want to talk about pre-trial disclosures. Now, in state court, in New York Supreme Court, uh, and in most state courts, you're going to have your uh, civil practice rules, your individual judges rules. Uh, those will always control any pretrial orders, compliance conferences that set end dates for disclosures those will generally control when you have to disclose certain things. Um, in federal court, which I'll touch on as well today, uh, the court will usually set a time for you to submit a pretrial order and they'll submit end dates for expert discovery, exchanging reports, things like that. But oftentimes you're left in that uncertain area of when do I need to disclose this? I get a lot of questions about CPLR 3101 D1. And many of you know that. And if you don't, you should please look it up. And if you do know what 3101 D1 is, it's pretty good to pull it up. Just Google it and read it. Uh, I did the other night. I hadn't read it in a while. I wanted to read it before today. And it's good to refresh a certain thing. Uh, and that is time limits. 3101 D1 refers to disclosing experts. And rule 3101 is disclosure in general. And the way our civil system works is you have to disclose everything that you plan on bringing out at trial. There's no trial by fire. There's no surprises like the old Perry Mason days, for those of you who remember that. No gotcha moments. You have to disclose everything. Think of my cousin Vinny when he gets the file from the defense lawyer. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you got to watch that movie. You have to disclose it all. So we each have an obligation as a plaintiff, as a defense attorney, that if you've got something, you have to disclose it. 
And the last thing you want is to get to trial and introduce something as evidence or call a witness or call an expert and have your adversary stand up and say, they were never disclosed to us. We didn't know they were calling this witness. We didn't know they were gonna introduce this evidence. The judge will turn to you and say, counselor, did you give them notice of this? And you go, uh, I don't know, that's a problem. Then things can get precluded. You've committed malpractice. You are at a disadvantage at the start of the trial. And uh, we don't want that to happen. So when you think about disclosures, think as you're getting closer after the certification, after the note of issue, uh, when you know that the next step in the case is a trial date, think about what you're going to want to put in at the time of trial. And that's what you want to immediately put together to disclose. Now, CPLR 3101D1 is the disclosure of experts. Experts are not treating physicians. That is the biggest question hands down I get. Do you have to disclose through a 3101D1 disclosure treating physicians? The answer is no, you do not. Treating physicians are deemed as witnesses. They're expected to be called. Um, they are expected to give uh, opinion testimony on causation and permanency. You do not need to do a 3101D1 disclosure for a treating physician. If you would like to be safe and you have an awesome treating physician who you know is going to give you good stuff, I would ask for a narrative report from that treating physician, ask them to address causation, permanency, findings, summary of treatment, and then exchange the narrative. And then in a cover letter, just say, uh, and we will be calling uh, this treating physician at the time of trial. That's it, okay? But technically, you're not required under 3101D1. You are required for any kind of expert, medical expert, biomechanical expert, accident expert, economic expert. And you need to give, you don't need to give a report in state court, uh, but you need to give a summary of their qualifications, of what they're gonna testify about. You have to attach their CV. Um, 3101D1, the statute tells you what you have to disclose and you have to do it. In the materials, a lot of what I gave you is from my pretrial disclosures from my last trial. Uh, some of you from earlier in the series know that my last trial was in Queens County before the Honorable Judge Sampson. I hope he's joining us today. Hello, Your Honor. And uh, I got the verdict like in the second week of March of last year. And then I think the next week everything shut down. So that was an accident case. My client's on a motorcycle who collided with an automobile. So a lot of the documents I've enclosed in the materials are from this case, the Amador case. And you'll see my 3101 D1 disclosure for our expert accident reconstructionist. Um, and you'll see how we enclose his details. I do not exchange reports. Uh, generally, because you're not required to. So I usually don't attach reports in the 3101D1, unless it's like an economic report or a life care plan, um, where you really want to make sure your adversary has all of the details. The reason I don't is because you're not required to. And sometimes it allows your adversary to really uh, do a lot of homework, pick apart the report, work on it with their expert, and come uh, loaded to, to bear on cross-examination. So better not to exchange a report unless you think it's going to be helpful to you. So think about that. Make sure you get your disclosures out. Do your 3101s. There is no time frame. Generally, we've always thought that you got to get your disclosures out 30 days before trial. You'll read through the statute. There's no time frame in the statute. In fact, um, if you have good reason to, to explain why to the judge, uh, you can disclose your expert with a 3101 the day of trial. Um, we've had that happen. We had a case where our adversary, the city of New York, the day of trial gave us 3101. They called the expert. The judge let him in, um, went up on appeal, and the second department said it was okay. So um, be aware. Don't rely on that, and you better have a good excuse and hope the judge goes your way. But there technically is no time requirement for a 3101D1 disclosure. I like to do it as soon as possible. Um, that could even be before filing the note of issue. If you anticipate summary judgment practice and you want to use that expert, um, there's an issue there that I'm not going to delve into now. But the bottom line is, as soon as you have it, disclose your experts, okay? The other things you want to disclose as early as possible is any evidence uh, that you want to get in at the time of trial. Um, okay, let me get, get our sponsor commercial going. Here we go. Um, remember, these are the folks putting the bill, so please listen to their messages and use their services. 
Before you step away, I'm an attorney in New York and I can save you hundreds of hours per year and reduce your clients' liens by an average of over 50% at no cost to your law firm. My team at Medical Lien Agency handles Medicare, Medicaid, Workers' Comp, ERISA, and private doctor's liens, and we only get paid based on the successful reduction of the lien. Our services get you and your clients paid faster. You practice the law, we'll handle the liens. Contact us today. I'm Elliot Stone with MedQuest Record Reform. We provide medical record retrieval, chronologies and demands by MDs for 35 an hour, experts, medical cost reports, including life care plans. Our settlement pay funding program lets you pay for all of these services at case conclusion. It's non-recourse, lose, and you owe nothing. There's no interest, you owe a sum certain, and no personal liability for attorneys. Thanks so much to our sponsors. Back to you, Andrew. Thank you, Michelle. So anything that you think is important to get into evidence at the time of trial that you want to use at the time of trial, you need to disclose. And you want to get that out as soon as possible. So any photograph, any exhibit, anything that your expert would like to use to assist that expert at the time of trial. If it's a physician, uh, we like to use uh, medical illustrations, anatomical exhibits, give uh, the uh, uh, anatomy lesson to the jury of the subject matter we're talking about. So I'll pre-disclose those and say we intend on introducing those at the time of trial. Photos uh, of whatever is involved in the case, whether it's a photo of an injury or an accident scene or a product, uh, you wanna disclose those prior to trial. Um, so make sure you get anything, any documents that are really, that weren't even demanded by your adversary, but you have and you want to use at the time of trial, you can't sit back on your laurels and say, well, this wasn't demanded. If you want to put it in, you need to disclose it. Here, look, we have this, just want to let you know, uh, you know, we, we want to move this in and we plan to move it in at the time of trial. This way it gives them the opportunity to object. Uh, if you need to do a deposition before trial or, or work it out, you can, and you're not, they can't claim prejudice at the last minute. So so you'll see uh, two questions that I noticed that were asked uh, in the chat or the Q&A during the break um, involves tie into this. One is, do I get a liability report and exchange it? Um, the answer is yes and no. I always get a liability report from my expert for myself. Um, and it's privileged. You don't have to disclose that. And so that report helps me uh, prepare for trial. I look through it. I ask them to break down either departures or codes or violations uh, or theories um, or statistics, whatever it may be, that will help me prepare for my questioning. Then I'll take that information and basically I'll take the conclusion section of the report and I'll use that in my 3101. At the end, I say the expert has reviewed and I put all that in and the expert is anticipated to testify as follows. And then you could just sort of list the conclusions from the report, but I don't exchange the report. There was another question about um, how do you define a treating physician? Is it by the number of visits? No, the way you define a treating physician is if the plaintiff went and for treatment, uh, that was not sent uh, for specifically evaluation for the litigation, either by the workers' comp doctor or uh, an IME or someone that, let's say I have a client that's treating with Dr. X for the whole time, but Dr. X says, hey, I'm not gonna uh, testify at trial, uh, so I'll retain a doctor to examine my client, render a report and be able to testify at the time of trial. You need to exchange that report and exchange that doctor as an expert because it's not a treating physician. Treating is someone that the plaintiff goes to on their own to get treatment and sees for treatment, not for purposes of evaluation for the litigation. That's the distinction. And so what you'll notice in my 3101 in the materials for my uh, accident reconstruction expert, Mike DeSico, I enclosed um, 
uh, diagram that he created based on his analysis, an overhead photograph with markings. And I served that and I said that we intend him to rely upon these exhibits at the time of trial and introduce them. And I also served those separately with a bunch of photographs of my client's motorcycle and accident scene photos and the defendant's vehicle photos and said we intend to introduce all of these at the time of trial. Doesn't mean you're going to. So you can serve, you know, 40, 50, 100 photos on your adversary, even in a Dropbox link and say we intend to. Uh, we may or will introduce uh, the enclosed photos at the time of trial. So more is better, send them everything and then you cherry pick uh, what you want, all right? So that's what you wanna do. You wanna disclose everything as early as possible. Start thinking about that for pretrial disclosures if you want it to go in at the time of trial. Now, moving from those disclosures to in limine motions. So an in limine motion is a motion that you're gonna to make to the trial judge before trial to try and keep uh, evidence out of the trial to preclude it from coming in. Now an in limine motion could be to preclude a witness uh, from testifying at trial. Uh, you may have heard of a Fry hearing in state court or, or a, a Daubert hearing in federal court where your adversary has disclosed an expert that you think is nonsense and you don't want that expert to come and testify. The best example I can give is an auto accident case I had where uh, my adversary uh, served me with an expert uh, 3101D1 disclosure from a biomechanical uh, engineer uh, claiming that the impact, the rear end impact to my client's vehicle was such so light and such a tap that there's no way she needed to have spinal fusion. It's, it's impossible under the laws of biomechanics. And uh, he had a medical degree and he had X, Y, and Z. And it was a very scary report to read it that it would blow us out of the water. And then when I started digging down and I researched this expert and found out he had been precluded uh, and found the decisions in some federal courts that cases that he had testified around the country and researched those cases and did my homework, I said, oh, we've got a pretty good basis to preclude this guy. So I filed an eliminate motion before trial and served it on my adversary. And uh, it was before we even had the trial date. And it worked great because I said to them, fine, you want to lowball my offer? You know, we think we're going to have success. Uh, we're going to you're going to lowball an offer to me and lowball the case and not settle it for what it's worth. Um, you know, you're, you're relying on your biomechanical engineer and we don't think that person's gonna come testify. So you're taking a big risk. And we use that as a negotiating point and it worked well, we got the case resolved. But you can move to preclude witnesses in limine. You can move to preclude testimony, specific parts of testimony from a witness. It could even be your own witness. If your client was asked at a deposition about a prior conviction or crime, as we talked about in the prior part uh, about depositions, that's okay for a deposition, but it may not be permissible for trial. You may wanna make an eliminate motion to preclude your adversary from asking that question at trial. And anything that you don't want to come out at trial, whether it's a question, whether it's the introduction of evidence, uh, whatever it may be, those are all game for in limine, pre-trial motions. Now, uh, when are those motions to be submitted? Uh, it depends on the judge. So you always, when you're gearing up for trial, looking at the judge's rules for whatever part you're in, wherever you are, in whatever county or state. Uh, some of them have their rules that say all eliminate motions must be submitted by 30 days prior to trial or 60 days after the note of issue is filed. So you better check that because you don't want to be uh, barred from making that motion because you didn't do it timely. So check those rules. If it's silent, um, then I believe you have right up until, and you can always try certainly up until you go to the time of trial, until uh, you get assigned to the trial judge, uh, you would want to bring it up when you meet for the first time with the trial judge, say, hey, your honor, before we go on the record, we have some eliminate motions. We need to see you before we pick a jury because we don't want them asking these questions to the jury panel because we moved, we wanna preclude that topic from even coming in to the trial. So you gotta be aware of that. So any pre-trial issues, um, some can be dealt with orally if it's short. Sometimes you can reach out to your adversary and say, are you gonna go here? Can we agree you're not? And can you put it in writing? If not, I'm gonna have to make a motion and I'd rather not. Um, 
Otherwise you wanna put it on papers. I've had people serve me with in limine motions the day we show up to, for opening statements and give it to the judge. Um, so that's not fun. And depending on the judge, some will adjourn to read it, some won't. Um, so in limine motions, think about anything that you may want to move to preclude uh, from trial and you need to address those uh, before trial. So the in limine motions, the pretrial disclosures, these are all sort of the slowly things getting ready to gear up early on, okay? Get that going as soon as you can. You don't want any time issues to, to hold you up there or, or bar you from any of these issues because you were just too slow on the trigger or didn't read the judge's rules. So make sure you get on top of that. Now, as we get closer to trial, um, there's gonna be time when you get a date certain and it's go time, right? It is go time. Uh, I remember my very first trial uh, was in 1997 and I was in um, Kings County and, uh, and I really thought I was gonna have more time. It was an auto accident case and I was anxious and I show up in the trial assignment part, which those of you who have appeared back in its heyday, uh, the trial assignment part in Brooklyn and Kings County is quite a scene. It was quite a scene. You have hundreds of lawyers. You've got the judges yelling at him. You got people begging. You've never seen such excuses for adjournments before. And I really didn't think I was gonna get sent out and I thought I had time. And the judge said, nope, uh, you're picking next week. Uh, there's no more adjournments. Uh, put in your slip today and you're picking. The sweat started dropping down my head and, and I turned and there was a pretty senior lawyer next to me. And I was like, oh man, I thought I was going to get an adjournment. He turned to me and said, go get him, kid. Get those subpoenas out. I was like, get those subpoenas out. Okay. What does that mean? <laughs> so I go back to the office, speak to my father. And I'm like, dad, I'm getting sent out on this case. He's like, all right, let's do it, man. This is it. You've been wanting to try a case. Let's go. So he said, I, I said, I got to get my subpoenas out. What does that mean? So let me tell you what it means. You need to do trial subpoenas. So any witness that is not under your control, who's going to voluntarily appear on your behalf, needs to be subpoenaed for trial. Uh, and medical records need to be subpoenaed. I've enclosed samples of all of these in the materials for you. The first thing we'll talk about is a police officer. So if it's an automobile accident or any type of civil case uh, where you wanna call the police officer and to testify to move the police report into evidence, to read from the memo book, you need to subpoena that police officer uh, to trial. And I've given you a sample. If it's in New York City, it goes to uh, one police plaza legal department. Uh, you serve them there. They will comply with it. You just have to serve, the, serve it with the witness fee. Um, and just always put on the bottom, please call to confirm date and time of appearance with your name, your phone number, and big block letters. You'll see it on the sample I gave you. This way, they're not showing up at a random date if it gets adjourned, and, and uh, they'll call you and you can fill them in on adjourned dates or when you actually need them for trial. Uh, you make it returnable to the either the trial judge if you know who it is or to the trial assignment part that sent you out. So you want to get those out right away. Then you want to make sure, and you want to try and do this earlier on, as early as possible, is you want to subpoena medical records. So whether you're the plaintiff or the defendant in a plaintiff's injury case, you're going to want to speak to each other and make sure each of you is subpoenaing records. You don't need to both do it. And you need to subpoena a certified copy of the chart. You want to see, subpoena a certified medical bill. Two separate subpoenas. They go to two different departments. You got your billing department and your records department. So you want to certify those records from the hospitals. Okay. You have to serve the subpoena with an authorization, a HIPAA authorization. You make it returnable to the court and it goes right there. It doesn't go to you and you have to pay for it. It's not free just because it's a subpoena. All right, these are costs. Trying a case gets really, really expensive. And so you need to do that. You need to subpoena the medical records and they need to be certified. If you get certified uh, medical bills and certified hospital records, boom, they go right in evidence. Uh, you don't need any other foundation pursuant to statute. Uh, they're deemed authenticated and admissible. And then you get to other witnesses. I always like to subpoena my adversary's witnesses that are necessary to call. I will speak to my adversary. I will say, are you producing these witnesses voluntarily or do I need to subpoena them? 
Sometimes they'll say, we'll do it voluntarily. I ask for that in writing. So this way, and I say, I'm going to call them in my case in chief, which I usually do. Um, so I let them know that. So when we show up at trial, there's no surprises. I could tell the judge, yep, defense witness one, two, three, four. I put them on my list. They said they've produ they'd produced them without a subpoena. Here's the letter. Um, if they're not willing to, or they're not sure if they have the authority to produce them, then um, serve them with a subpoena and ask them if they can accept service. So you'll see, I gave samples of that. In my, uh, the Amador case, uh, it was a owner and driver of a vehicle that were the defendants. So I sent a letter to defense counsel with copies of the subpoena for each of them and asked them to confirm that he has the authority to accept it and that he would produce them. So you wanna get your subpoenas out um, right away, get everything to the courthouse. So that's really important. That's in the gear up phase. If you know earlier on that you're gearing up uh, and have some more time, that's great for the medical records because all trial attorneys will tell you stories about scrambling to get medical records at the last minute. Um, it's not fun at all. Uh, so you wanna start that process as early as possible. The police you can get fast and the defense witnesses you can get fast, um, but you wanna get those subpoenas out for records pretty early. All right. Now, then you wanna start working on your trial file. Now what I, everybody has their own way, if they have one of setting up a trial file when you're gearing up for trial. What I do is I take a red well, and then I, I basically have two red wells if it's a big enough volume of a case, enough paperwork to fill it or one. And I will have all of the folders basically in alphabetical order in manila folders. And then I'll have all the medical records in alphabetical order in red. In my office, in our files, we have them like sort of color coordinated. coordinated. Uh, in the last year, actually, we haven't used any manila folders or red wells at all. We've been virtual. So uh, that may change things. But if I was going to trial uh, next week, I would probably print out, uh, not probably, I definitely would print out everything and put them into a trial folder. And this way you will have, you can have just the liability folder and you could save the red well with all the medicals uh, for damages. Um, or you can have them both in one, depending on what type of case you have, if it's bifurcated, if you need them all at once. And in that trial folder, you're going to sit down with a pad and you're going to make a list of everything to be organized for that case. And I'm going to give you some examples of what I like to do uh, in my trial file. I'll put opening statements, trial notes. By the way, everything I'm gonna say now is its own Manila subfolder. Opening statements, trial notes, uh, plaintiff uh, deposition, and I'll put the name of the plaintiff. There's more than one plaintiff name deposition. Same thing with the defense witness, defendant uh, name deposition. Uh, then I'll make folders for cross-examination. Uh, I'll make folders for jury selection. I'll make folders for um, photographs. I'll make folders for um, exhibits. Uh, I'll make folders for marked pleadings, folders for subpoenas. The idea is to prepare and be organized. So this way, when you show up to trial, you have your trial folder. I stick mine, I've got a nice rolly briefcase that it fits into. And I roll into court, I open it up and I've got everything nice and neat and organized. When we talk about trial at the next part, I'll talk about the importance of being organized at your counsel table. Um, it's all part of this preparation process to make sure that you are on it, smooth and prepared. The trial file is an important part. So get organized, think about everything that you're gonna want at your fingertips and put it in the trial file. It may be a verdict search uh, results. It may be a maybe articles in the news, it, whatever it may be, you wanna break it down and it doesn't mean you're putting a lot of stuff in there. It's just to be organized. I have some manila folders with one or two pages in it that are an important document. You know, um, I may have something that says statutes. I may have one that says case law on the cases that I know, one that says in limine motions. So trial files are really important because they're gonna be separate from that big, huge, voluminous file that you've developed over the last couple of years of litigating this case. You sort of pick out and fine tune what you really want. So get your trial file organized, all right? All part of gearing up. That's what you're gonna take with you when you go to pick a jury and try the case, which we'll talk about in part five, the trial that's next.
actually, no, part six is next. Uh, I got caught up today. So part six is next, it's the trial. Part seven is gonna be what happens after trial and wrapping up the case and then wrapping up the series. So now let's talk about what you're gonna need. Um, actually, before we talk about that, in federal court, the nice thing about federal court, the good and the bad, the bad is that you gotta do all this stuff well in advance in a pretrial order. And what a pretrial order is in any federal court, if you're gonna try a case before the magistrate or the, uh, the district judge, you will be required to fill out a pretrial order and it's a pain in the butt. And what it does is it basically asks you to put your whole case down in writing, have your adversary put their whole case down in writing, both of you review it together, sign off on it and submit it. You have to put you know, the issues involved, your positions, your witness lists, um, your exhibits, you have to pre-mark your exhibits, any issues of law, any motions you're gonna make, you have to attach things, you have to put it all in there and get it submitted. So you don't have the luxury of waiting to a week before a trial to figure out what exhibits you want or what things you want to blow up uh, or, you know, and you've got to figure it all out now because you can't decide the night before a trial. Oh, I want to put this into evidence. This is a goodie. You need to figure that out for the pretrial order. So I've enclosed a sample of a pretrial order from a case that I had uh, before Magistrate Judge uh, Peck in the Southern District a while back, a case I tried uh, with my father Guy, uh, an auto accident involving a bus and a car and my client on a bicycle. And uh, so you'll see what that looks like. So again, in the series, uh, in this series, I've touched on federal practice. If you haven't seen it yet, uh, there's a great uh, prior CLE I did with my good friend and past president, Hadley Matarazzo, on litigating a federal case. Uh, but the pretrial order is a really important part. It forces you to prepare your case, which is great. It's bad because you have to prepare your case before you even know if you're going to try it. Um, so you're going to have to get that ready. And that does a lot of uh, all of what we've been talking about, puts it all together. All right. Now, if you have not been in federal court and done a pretrial order, you've done your pretrial disclosures, you've gotten your subpoenas out, you've gotten your trial file together, what next? What next do you need to do to get ready to gear up for trial? You need to put together sets of usually three sets. If you have more than one adversary, it's going to be multiple sets of marked pleadings. What are marked pleadings? Marked pleadings, and I've given you my sample of marked pleadings are enclosed in the materials from my, this same trial, the Amador trial, and you'll see what they are and what we do with them. Marked pleadings are when you, you take a set and you label it on the top with the caption as marked pleadings, and it's a package you create. And on the top, it's going to have your complaint, and then it's going to follow that with the answer. If there's any amended or supplemental complaints and amended or supplemental answers, those will all follow. Um, then you'll put your bill of particulars, you'll put your um, supplemental bill of particulars and however many there are, and you put them all together and then you put a nice back on it and you label it as uh, marked pleadings and you have a set, one for yourself, one for the judge, one for your adversary. And if you have more than one adversary is set for each adversary. And you're going to put all those nice and neatly in your marked pleadings sub manila folder in your trial file. Because those of you who have tried a case know that the first thing the judge is going to ask you for when you meet with the judge, either before or after picking a jury, depending on how it works, where you go to try the case, is counsel. You got marked pleadings and it's on the plaintiff's counsel to have. Them. So you want to say, yep, and you pass it to them. So if you look at my mark pleadings on the, the back page, sort of my uh, the legal back that folds over the back that labels it with my information, you're going to see handwritten notes on there. And I purposely left those in there so I could briefly just tell you what they were about. So I showed up before Judge Sampson. And if anybody's appeared before Judge Sampson, you have to be on point. If you show up without your act together, you are going to have a very, very unpleasant time. And so when you do show up, the first he's on, thing, just so you know, he's on. Hey, Your Honor, I know you're smiling. I know you're smiling. And I know everyone who's been before you is smiling. So I showed up and, uh, and I meet with his honor, turns to me and he says, Mr. Smiley, do you have your mark pleadings? And I know probably a lot of lawyers, most lawyers are don't. And I say, of course, Your Honor. And I hand them to him. 
And right off the bat, he goes, okay, that's check one for Mr. Smiley, plaintiff's lawyer. I, I might like this guy. He might be okay. And that's what you want. We'll get to the trial, but you need to show you're prepared, you're on point. And that's how you're going to get uh, the best result possible at a trial uh, and for your client and get the respect of the court, your adversary, the courtroom. And so, yes, I gave it to him. And then his honor started firing questions at me. He asked about the case. He, he jumped in. Well, what about this? Well, how old your client? Well, was he wearing gloves? Well, what kind of motorcycle was it? Um, what was the temperature that day? So he fired all these questions at me. And the ones that I had an answer for, I told him. The ones I thought I knew the answer to, I told him, but I said I wasn't positive. And the ones I didn't have an answer for, I said, Your Honor, I'm sorry, I don't know that, but I can get the answer for you very quickly. You have to be honest. Don't BS your way before any judge, okay? So my notes on the back of that, I, I pull it out. I gave him his set of mark pleadings. I had mine. And so I start writing notes quickly. I didn't have time to get my legal pad out. So those are my notes with the questions. And I said, I'll have those right back for you first thing tomorrow morning when I come back to court, Your Honor. And then he says, well, where are your requests to charge? Well, where's your verdict sheet? Uh, his Honor wanted all of these. Some judges want that stuff before the trial starts. They don't want to wait until the end of the trial. So he said, I want your verdict sheet tomorrow. I want your request to charge on damages and liability tomorrow. So I made quick notes of that, all right, on the back. And so you'll see my notes and that's notes for myself to make sure I respond to what his honor wants to know. And then I get everything done for him. Um, so you have to be prepared in that way. And next time I appear before his honor, which I hope I will, um, I'm going to show up with my request to charge and my verdict sheet and all that, because I know that's what the court wants. So I've given you a sample of request to charge. I've given you an, a, a sample of a proposed verdict sheet and feel free to use those. You're gonna modify those uh, on every case, uh, but you should have those prepared before trial and you should review all the pattern jury instructions uh, before trial. That should be in your slow roll gearing up for trial. That should be at the beginning of the case, frankly. I always go to the PJI. That's one of those things that um, stays in my father's office. He's the gatekeeper of the fresh set of PJI volumes each year. And we go in there, we look up the index, we pull out the, because that's the charge. We all think we know the law. We may research the law, but what the jury is going to be charged, that language we need to know. We need to know how the jury is going to process what their instructions are going to be so that we can tailor uh, the, the verbiage we use. Are we going to ask in a medical malpractice question, our experts, did the defendant depart from good and accepted practice? Or are we going to ask, did they depart from the standard of care? Hmm, I don't know. Let's look at the PJI. What's the charge say? We want to use that phrase. So not only do you want to look through the PJI charges, the pattern jury instructions, but you're going to want to prepare your own charges and put everything that you think applies to your case, even if it's borderline. That's what charging conferences are for. We'll talk about that in a later series. But um, you want to have that and have that ready to be submitted to the court. The good news is, is if you're somewhat skilled on a computer, you can get all the PJI online, uh, certainly through Westlaw and Lexis and probably elsewhere. And you can copy and paste into a Word document. What I always ask uh, the, the, the judge or the judge's law secretary that asks for it is I say, do you need just the charge name and number? Do you need the language in the charge? Do you need the, the boilerplate, initial introductory stuff? So you can, it's good to ask questions. Always ask questions, okay? I do it. I've been doing this a long time. I always ask because everybody does it differently. Every judge, every courtroom. So that way you know how to prepare and to provide exactly what they're being asked for. And especially sometimes you're going to need to modify the charges for your specific case. So you're going to want to prepare uh, the request to charge in the verdict sheet. I've given you samples of that. Lastly, what I'd like to do in preparing for trial is to prepare a pre-marked exhibit list. And I've given you a sample of one that, um, that is in the materials that you'll find there. And I highly recommend that everybody generate a pre-marked exhibit list uh, for themselves uh, for trial and to have an extra set uh, for your adversary and an extra set for uh, the court, the judge. And what pre-marking is, uh, for those of you who have not tried a case before, 
or those who haven't, haven't pre-marked exhibits, um, generally the way you mark an exhibit is you will um, go through a process of trial on direct examination with your witness, sometimes with an adverse witness. But um, it basically goes like this. You ask the court if you can mark a document for identification, then you ask the court, and when I say court, I mean judge. And you ask the judge, may I approach the witness after it's been marked, uh, you uh, show it to the witness, you ask the witness, you say, I'm showing what's been marked for identification, plaintiff's exhibit one, do you recognize it? Yes, what do you recognize it to be? Oh, this is a photograph of my car. And does this photograph fairly and accurately represent your car as it appeared uh, on the date of the accident immediately after the accident? Yes, it does. Um, and will it aid and assist you in your testimony today? Yes, it will. Then you turn, Your Honor, we offer what's been marked as Plaintiff's Exhibit 1 for identification into evidence as Plaintiff's Exhibit 1. The judge turns to your adversary, any objection? Adversary stands up, no objection. Judge says it's in evidence. It's marked as Plaintiff's Exhibit 1 in evidence. That is a little primer on getting things into evidence. Um, now, that's the traditional way of putting an item into evidence, whether it's a record, a photograph, or whatever it may be, or an exhibit for your witness to use. Now, by pre-marking, some courts, certainly in the federal courts, everything needs to be pre-marked. So that's what you'll see in the pretrial order. And what that means is you're pre-marking all the exhibits before you get to court. Uh, and if you, you have to label them all, and you'll see on the sheet I provided, it's sort of a chart. On the left is the pre-marked number. On the middle is what it is. So it'd be pre-marked exhibit one, uh, photograph of motorcycle on day of accident, blow up, um, entered into evidence as is left blank, all right? And you list that for everything. Then what you can do is you can show up at the time of trial, you exchange it, the defendant does it, and some judges will ask you to pre-mark everything. If there's a dispute or an objection to something going to evidence that can be addressed or either pre-trial or pre-witness getting on the stand or just address it at the time and it's not pre-marked, uh, it's not entered into evidence and it expedites things. It makes the, the trial move more quickly because you don't have to go through all of the steps with each witness as I just went through. So that's one benefit of pre-marking. The other is if you have a judge say, um, I don't do pre-marking, you're gonna move everything in evidence at the time of trial through the witness. And many and most judges do that. I think his honor, Judge Sampson did that in our case. So then what I do, is I keep that list for myself and I keep it with my exhibits folder. It's the first uh, document with all the exhibits after it. And then what I do is when, you know, usually as the plaintiff, I'm the first person offering exhibits. So I know what order they're going in. I know which witnesses I'm calling. You have to prepare all of this in advance. I go through it. I pre-mark everything for myself. And that's what I'm gonna ask for that first photograph to be pre-marked as, and I give them my number. Sometimes you have to jive and move if things change and change your pre-mark number, but then you pre-mark it at the time. And then what goes into evidence, if it gets admitted into evidence, then you mark it on the right. Then by the end of the trial, I've got red markers all over. I've got numbers. I add things on, new stuff that comes out, maybe something my adversary puts into evidence. I put what that is, but I actually, that creates my whole list of everything that's gone into evidence at trial, what number it is. And it's really helpful because by the end of trial, so the end of this case before my summation, when I'm preparing for summation and I've got my outline and my legal pad, I'll then say, all right, now show jury enlargement of damage to motorcycle. And then I'll put in a big red number, uh, exhibit one. And then later on, now go to diagram from expert with uh, speed marks, um, show exhibit 11. And so then what I do is before my summation and before the jury's called in, I ask for a quick break um, and I get all my exhibits lined up and I have the numbers, I look and it's all coordinated. So at the time of my summation, it's right there. I grab it, I hold it up. This is the kind of preparation that goes in to making a trial run smoothly. And then when people say, wow, I saw your summation, how'd you remember everything? And you knew what exhibit number that was and which one to grab. And they think you just like do all this on the fly without seeing all this behind the scene homework. And that's really, it's preparation folks. That's how you win cases. So we've got about five minutes left in the first official hour. And as most of you know, what we'll do for the, um, 
for from 2 to 2.30 is Q&A. So I've looked at some of the questions, some really great questions that have been posted. I'm going to address a few of them now. The rest, I'm going to try and address all of them through the Q&A. So if you have questions, please drop them in the Q&A right now. Comments, drop them in. Anything you want to talk about, drop it in. We'll try and do that in the next half an hour. I encourage people to stay on if you'd like. Uh, that's usually where we get a lot of good stuff going and some more interaction. Um, before um, I get to a few questions, um, I just want to reiterate how awesome it's been, uh, the sense of community we've been building since uh, part one. Uh, I've been interacting with lawyers that I've never met before uh, this year as a result of this series on a regular basis. We talk on the phone, we email, we Zoom. Uh, I've been referring cases out. A lot of lawyers, hey, I'm, I'm working, I'm trying to build a practice, I'm learning a lot. You know, I'll take anything you, you, if you can help me out, if you think it's a good case for me. Um, and, you know, we handle certain types of cases. Uh, we don't handle certain types. So there's been referrings going on. Uh, there's just been lots of good back and forth. And the overwhelming response I continue to get from all of you, and I appreciate it, is that they're, they're really psyched to have this community where we're all working together, helping each other to become better lawyers. And that's what I'm all about. That's what the Mentor ESQ is about. So let's keep that going. Um, and uh, if you like my material uh, that I deliver my CLEs and you haven't listened to the podcast and you're not listening to it now, uh, I encourage you to go. I have some screenshots in the materials. You'll see what the new site looks like. You can sort by CLE. You could sort by interviews. All I do is interview lawyers, uh, except for one, which was a marketing interview uh, for lawyers. And we have some really amazing lawyers in our profession with great backgrounds and interesting stories. And I'm really proud that I've gotten those and shared those with you. So please reach out to me if you have some great stories. Uh, and I'd love to have you on as a guest. All right, that being said, let's move on to uh, some questions that I think uh, need to be addressed before this hour is over. Um, first of all, how do you get the record subpoenaed? Um, how it used to be in the old days is every courtroom has a box that says drop your subpoenas off here. You drop a subpoena off that needs to be so ordered, which police officer subpoenas do need to be. City hospitals need to be so ordered. You want to drop those off in the box. And then usually if you show up uh, the next day, you can get it. Uh, or you can use one of the court services uh, if you have one. If not, there are plenty of court services that will put it in the box, get it so ordered, and send it back to you. These days, I don't know if that's changed. Uh, frankly, I haven't had a case go to trial uh, since the pandemic started. So uh, I'll let you know. But that's how you get them subpoenaed. Um, another really good question is, what do you do if a doctor's treating physician refuses to appear? Um, that's often a problem. What you need to do is early on in the case is you need to um, reach out to your treating doctor and find out if he or she is willing to cooperate and appear at trial. Um, some doctors we know will not cooperate at trial. Uh, off the top of my head, most of the surgeons at Hospital for Special Surgery here in New York will not testify at trial. They make that very clear. I think they even put it on their intake forms for their clients. Um, so right off the bat, if we see we have a client that's treated there, we'll, we'll look to get them evaluated by our own uh, orthopedists. So it's a problem. Uh, then you need to get your own expert uh, and get them evaluated. Uh, get a report, exchange the report, and exchange them as an expert. That's what you do. Okay. Um, someone refers to what I'm talking about in my trial folder. Sounds like a trial notebook that's being required by the Supreme Court justices in the ninth. Um, I don't know. I don't practice in the ninth, but um, I do have a trial notebook, which is also separate. Uh, and I'll talk about that in the next part, which is separate from my trial folder. So just a little heads up that we're going to talk about that. The trial notebooks is a little bit different. Someone asked me about if I've had any issue with marked pleadings. And I realized other than talking about having them and what they are, I didn't really talk about what it means to mark the pleadings. So what marked pleadings are is you will go down on the complaint and any subsequent amended complaints. Um, and you or a staff member that you assign to it will mark all of your allegations in your complaint to correspond with the answer uh, to that number. So if in your complaint, it says number one, uh, plaintiff Oscar Amador resides at such and such location in Queens, New York, one, one, what, what, what. All right, your adversary, it may put admits, denies, or denies a knowledge upon information and belief. So admit is A, D is deny, denies knowledge is DKI. 
So what you're going to do is you'll sit down and match them both up and you go through them number by number and you write on the complaint next to each of those numbers, whether it was admitted, whether it was denied or DKI. And so what happens is when you and I've never had a problem ever with Mark pleadings, usually you'll give it to the judge, the judge will look through pretty quickly um, and whatever is of interest to the judge. Some judges are more concerned about jurisdiction whether there's any dispute. Some judges are looking at um, whether they're incorporated here, whether they admit ownership, whether they deny ownership. Um, they may wanna look at the injuries that are alleged in the BP, but generally the court, when we show up for trial, the judge will look at it, is pleased you have it, uh, and then we'll flip through it a little bit and then probably put it to the side to review it later in more detail. I've never had problems. So we are into the Q&A. For those of you that hung around for this, I thank you. I know you're doing it because you have a thirst for information. It's really not that half credit that uh, we all probably have way more CLE credits these days than we ever thought we'd need. Uh, so for the 800 plus of you hanging around and for my podcast listeners, so I know you're hanging around, I thank you. So let's get to some questions. I will try and answer them all if I can. Um, and if I think they really apply to this topic area, if I don't know the answer, I'll tell you, I don't know if someone else uh, who is listening and uh, tuning in has that answer, uh, please drop it in the Q&A and I'd appreciate it. So um, someone's asking about, um, you know, there's a few questions that touch on the disclosures and whether or not there has to be a disclosure demand uh, before that hasn't been responded to uh, before you move to preclude. I mean, generally what you want to do and how that plays out as far as uh, whether there's been demands for disclosure, whether you've complied with statutes. Um, I'll be the first to say that I'm not one that can shoot out statute uh, numbers fast. I know 3101D1 um, and a couple others. I can tell you about 202.20D, uh, which is the new one, which is the equivalent of 30B6 for depositions. Uh, but uh, there are a lot of, frankly, statutes that I just don't know. And uh, that if I look at, I'd probably be surprised what they say. So a lot of people in the Q&A are dropping all these uh, disclosure. 3122A, 4532A. Uh, I wish my father was here because he's really good at those. He knows all those statutes off the top of his head. I don't, I just know more of practice. And I know that generally, if you demand everything in my demands, which I provided in I think part two of this series, a sample of the demands, we demand all the expert disclosures. We demand all photographs and videos of our client. We put everything's continuing demand up through and including trials. So we've demanded everything. Um, so that covers our butt that if they come up with something, my adversary can't say, well, you never demanded this. And most defense firms do the same. They have all their demands in their answer. So again, you know, you're going to update your demands either by letter form, by email, um, and you don't have to serve a statute. Ultimately, most trial judges are practical, and they're basically going to turn to each of you and say, did you disclose this before trial or not? And what's the issue? What's the prejudice? Um, and th they'll have the authority uh, within their um, discretion to allow certain things based on that. So um, I've never had a problem as far as disclosure of medical records, um, and I think that Records still, the question is, do they have to come in um, via subpoena, even if they've been disclosed pursuant to statute? Uh, again, some statutes like for treating doctors, say a certified copy, and if you fulfill those requirements, that might be 3122A, um, then you don't need to call them at trial and you can move them in that way. So I know that that is a way you can get documents in without subpoenaing them. Obviously, if you have a witness on the stand, you could subpoena them. So there are ways around it. Basically, think two categories, hospital or medical facility or any type of facility like a nursing home, rehab, inpatient, those places you're going to want to subpoena the bills and the certified records. Small office practices, individual doctors, doctors groups, those are the ones that are not going to move in in the same way as a medical chart uh, under the statute. But the new, newer rules within the CPLR will find ways for you to get those into evidence as long as the doctor's office will work with you and give you an appropriate certification uh, that you need to comply with the rule and you serve that in advance to your adversary. So hopefully I answered that question. All right. Um, 
Someone's asking again, to be clear, is a treating physician a different category than an expert and does not have the same disclosure requirements? Yes, to be clear, it is different. Treating physicians are different. I know this question comes up a lot. You do not need a 3101 D1 for a treating physician. If I am wrong, please someone tell me why put in the statute or the case law and I'll acknowledge I am wrong, but uh, I do not believe the law has changed in the last 25 years. 3101 D1 experts does not refer to treating physicians. Um, someone's talking about getting out of state records and how you deal with that, uh, getting them enforced. Um, again, they put in their own answer that if you follow the CPLR, providing notice, folks, again, this is what it's all about. All these rules are designed so that no one gets caught up at the time of trial. No one gets surprised. So when in doubt, whenever you want to get into evidence, serve it early. If it's record, serve it with certifications, you know, serve discs of imaging, you know, serve everything you have. Give them the whole file, just like in my cousin Vinny. More is better. Um, if it's anything you think is going to go into evidence, serve it with notice, keep records of it as early as possible, and you're going to be in good shape. Um, okay. Uh, is it admissible to tell a jury during summation that a doctor refuses to appear to testify at trial? It's a really great question. So oftentimes um, people ask me, well, if the treating doctor doesn't show up, isn't a jury going to wonder, you know, why... Um, why the treating physician isn't there and why someone else is there. And I find that the jury really doesn't even think about it, that if you're calling an expert and that expert saying, yes, I evaluated uh, the plaintiff on this date, I did this exam, I reviewed these records, these are my opinions. I mean, it's fair commentary for my adversary to cross-examine that expert and say, well, you're not the treating physician, are you? And say, that's right. Um, I don't know if it's fair to say that uh, if your adversary can comment on it, um, at summation uh, or brings it up, um, but you can comment. You could say something that, unfortunately, we weren't able to get the treating physician here. So we did the second best thing. We made sure that we had a physician who could go over everything. And, if, and you judged the physician we brought in on his or her credibility, on their review and what they had to say. So I think you can touch on it um, if you need to. I haven't had that problem, fortunately, usually isn't too much of a problem if the person that you bring in is appropriate, okay? Um, all right, someone's asking about the difference, if I can explain, between exhibits that are marked at an EBT versus pre-marked exhibits based on an agreement between lawyers at trial. That's a great question. So exhibits marked at a deposition have nothing to do with exhibits marked for trial. In fact, they can become a problem because if they have a sticker on it, and uh, I believe we ran into this problem in my case with uh, Judge Sampson because we had a lot of photos from the actual accident scene that were marked as exhibits that were used at deposition. So if, let's say the defendant showed a lot of these photos to my client, they would have been defendants A, B, C, D. And I'm not gonna introduce those as trial as what we've pre-marked as a defendant's exhibit B, if that's the one exhibit that I wanna use. I'm gonna to wanna to reintroduce that fresh as a plaintiff's exhibit one, for example. So his honor said, listen, you gotta you got to fix this up here. Don't be putting this in with this exhibit number because the jury's gonna be confused. And he was right. So we needed to address that. And sometimes you get the old scissors, keep a scissors in your trial file, keep tape, keep markers, keep black tape. We get creative. We put black tape over stuff. We cut things out <laughs> in the courtroom. Uh, that's what trial lawyers do. So it's very different. So the, the markings at an EBT are not pre-marking. And unless they happen to be all the exhibits that you and your adversary agree that you want to go into trial mark that way, all power to you, then yeah, you can do that. But I find it almost implausible that that would be the case. So uh, two separate things, okay? You would refer to exhibits marked at a deposition in your summary mo motion papers, if you're referring to them as what was marked at the deposition as, but at trial, it's a whole different story, okay? Um, all right. Bear with me, I'm reading through, there's a lot of questions. All right, so a good question is asking about, do you have to disclose an expert that you only intend to call in rebuttal 
uh, to dispute a defense expert theory, not necessarily for the plaintiff's prima facie case? That's a great question. Now, I'm gonna give you two answers. One is uh, what is required under the law and two is what I do. And feel free to use whichever you want and they may be the same. I do not believe you are required to disclose an expert uh, that you only intend to call as a rebuttal witness uh, prior to the start of trial. I believe you're only required to call uh, your prima facie witnesses in your case in chief. I believe that is the rule. Someone please chime in and let me know. However, my practice would be to um, disclose uh, any rebuttal expert that I would plan to use. The reality is, is that if my adversary is bringing in a biomechanical engineer um, and I'm planning on bringing one in, I'm gonna disclose that to rebut them. And chances are I'm probably gonna call them in in advance preemptively, strategically. Um, so something as simple as, uh, please be advised that we may call uh, expert so-and-so as a rebuttal witness. Um, so this way you can play it out if they don't call their expert and you don't think you need to, you've just saved yourself some prep time, some money uh, and all of that and, uh, and another witness and disclosing who your expert might be. Um, uh, well, you're disclosing the expert, obviously, if you send that letter, uh, but I would do that. I think that that's the safe practice. If you know you're going to likely call an expert as a rebuttal witness to disclose it, but someone check me on it. I do not think you are required to do so. Do I have a sample trial subpoena that you can share? Uh, I will not name names, but take a look at the materials, my friend. I referenced it earlier on. Maybe you joined in late. Yes, they are in the materials here. Take a look. Um, in motor vehicle accident cases, would I make an eliminate motion to deal with prior accidents? I certainly would if I didn't think that they had any probative value in my case. So for example, in my Amador case, uh, my client's on a motorcycle. He collided at an intersection. He was turning as well as the uh, defendant's automobile was turning. Um, and he suffered uh, serious leg injuries and fractures, a stroke in the hospital and some scarring and some other uh, injuries. Now, if he was questioned and answered, which wasn't the case, uh, had you ever been in a prior motorcycle accident? And he said, yes, he was rear-ended by a motorcycle um, and he had soft tissue back injuries um, that didn't really require any treatment and he didn't injure any parts of his body um, that were injured in this case or were at issue in this case, then I would most def definitely make an in limine. Uh, and I would probably do that orally. I don't think that would have to be on papers, but I would bring it to the court's attention. I would look at the rules, see if I had to put it in writing, in which case I would, because it wouldn't be probative. So I definitely want to preclude that. What relevance would that have? Because then a jury might think, oh, your guy got in another accident. Maybe Maybe uh, you know he's prone to accidents and it was his fault. You wanna get rid of that. So definitely those are the types of things you wanna think about. You wanna cut out the fat. You wanna cut out the noise. That, that's fair game in a deposition, but when you're preparing for trial or when you're sitting at the deposition and your adversary is asking these questions of your witness, you wanna take notes. Hey, we better move to preclude this before we get to trial. I don't think it's relevant. I let the adversary ask it, but let's keep it out. That's what you should be doing during depositions, okay? Similarly, don't object stuff just because you think it's not admissible at trial. That's not the basis for an objection, all right? Uh, and let your witness answer it and let your adversary ask it, and then you deal with it and eliminate. That's what this is all about. There's a difference between what's permissible to be disclosed and asked at a deposition from trial, and that's what eliminates deal with, and that's what the trial courts deal with, okay? Um, someone chimed in. I think there was a question about where the subpoenaed records get sent. I believe someone said, if you have a certified copy, is that good enough? Uh, the answer is no. You need to have the records sent to court. Um, and then how you get them is before trial. What I like to do uh, is before picking a jury, I like to go to the jury part. Um, and this is pre-pandemic also, but I would do it again now if we're up and running. Uh, see what's going on there, pop my head in, see what the jury pool looks like, see where the jury rooms are, see where I'm likely going to be picking a jury, feel comfortable with the environment so I know what to expect when I go to pick. After I take my walk through and sort of size things up, ask some questions of the local lawyers that are there all the time of how things are flowing there. Then I'll go to the subpoenaed records room. Then I pull the file. 
Um, all you do is you show up at the desk at the subpoenaed records room, you give them uh, your, you give them a caption, maybe some ID, they see you're an attorney on the file, you have to sign it out, you sit there, you go through, you see what records you have, you see if any are missing, you make notes. If anything's missing, you go back to your office and you track them down. Um, so that's also what you need to do to gear up for trial. So good question. You wanna make sure everything's there and you're not surprised then what happens is, is they you give them back. You can't take them out of the subpoenaed record room. You can make copies of stuff if you'd like. It's also good to see what your adversary subpoenaed. Um, then you, um, so bring change with you uh, for the copy machine. Then you uh, go to trial. And then when you're about to get underway, uh, the uh, court will request from the subpoenaed record rooms that they deliver the subpoenaed records. And then you and your adversary will have the time uh, in the courtroom at table to go through all the records, see if there's issues, see if there's anything missing. Sometimes you want to redact things uh, before they go into evidence, before you would stipulate. Uh, so you sort all that out at trial. Okay. All right. Um, why would medical bills be necessary unless they were unreimbursed economic damages? Great question. Uh, this is a gear up for trial question as well as a trial question. So Let's say your client was injured, was hospitalized for a month, had a lot of surgeries. The bills totaled $300,000. But those bills uh, have been paid for uh, by maybe workers' compensation, maybe private insurance, maybe some no fault was involved in that or excess no fault. And your client didn't have to pay anything out of pocket. And they wouldn't be able to recover that at the end of the day. So why would that go into trial? Aha, here is why you do this because there's a collateral source hearing that happens after the jury verdict. So when you're putting in your damages case, you can put in every bill, everything. It doesn't matter and it doesn't go into evidence whether it's been reimbursed or not, whether your client paid it or not is not probative, will not come in a time of trial. It is just the billing amount, okay? And those are past medical bills, and then you can, through evidence, put in evidence through your doctors, through life care planners, uh, of future medical costs. And then what will happen is in the jury verdict sheet, um, if you've submitted that evidence, there will be a line for damages, past pain and suffering, past medical damages, and then future pain and suffering and future medical damages. So all of these past bills, this $300,000 medical bill, and those little $5,000, $10,000, twenty, dollars uh, whatever other bills you have, get them all, get them all in evidence. Let's say they total $350,000. Those will all go into evidence. And when I go to give my summation and I get to the part of the trial where I'm asking for money, I always start with the hard numbers. Those would be life care plans. Uh, past medical bills like this, um, lost wages, what we call the hard numbers. So this line item, this 350,000, that's been stipulated. Members of the jury, this is a damages only trial. Um, you know, we've won liability. You have to put this line in. We probably even ask, and oftentimes it gets stipulated and that line's filled in, believe it or not. If it's a unified trial, then you say, if you find for the plaintiff, as I believe you should based on the evidence, uh, and you should award damages. When you get to this point, there's no dispute. The defense hasn't disputed. You can even ask for a stipulation, which, would I, which is what I do. I ask on the record that defense counsel stipulate that these are the certified bills and they're fair and accurate. And they, he, you know, there's no basis to object to them unless they have reason to believe it's not a fair and accurate bill. So then you say, so here are economic damages and it starts you off at $350,000. So then you turn to the jury and there's gonna be more numbers hopefully, but let's say that's all the economic damages you have. Then you say, now let's get to the tough part, the pain and suffering. These are just what the medical bills only cost 350,000. This is nothing, this is just to pay the tab. The real damages here are the injuries that my client sustained and will sustain for the rest of her life. The future damages, the pain and suffering, waking up every day and not being able to tie her shoes, not being able to throw a baseball uh, with his grandson, um, not being able to go to work as a construction worker because he's in a wheelchair. These are the real injuries, not the medical bills. So 
let's talk about what the real damages are here. The 350,000, that's just to cover the medical costs, okay? So that's why you put in medical bills. That's why you work so hard to get every single certified medical bill. Because if your client's been injured, it has a lot of bills, that says a lot about the injury and it'll reflect well with your adversary. If you're the plaintiff and the carrier, they'll say, wow, it's a serious injury. There's a half a million in bills. It will also reflect kindly with the jury. They're gonna say, well, this is a bad injury. It's a half a million in bills, okay? So it's very important um, that you address that. All right, let's get to some other questions. All right, not too many, come on folks, put them in there. I think we've had a hundred comments and questions in prior parts. Uh, we've got nine more minutes, all right? Um, someone's asking my thoughts. You regarding... prepared them so well in uh, all of these prior parts. They have, they have nothing left to add. <laughs> you have to do a code for this last uh, half a credit? Yeah, in a, in a minute or two. It's all okay. good. All right, good. great. No worries. Um, so someone's asking if a certified copy of a medical record used at a deposition, can you use that for trial again? Um, no, it has to be subpoenaed. Now, keep in mind that your adversary can stipulate and agree to anything. And it's another reason, many of you know, I've been talking about the importance of camaraderie with our adversaries. That just because I'm a plaintiff and my adversary is representing a defendant doesn't mean that we have to be adversaries. We're both trying to do a good job. We both have clients. Let's help each other out. We're both lawyers. We're both most likely gonna have different cases together. And chances are, I'm gonna be on the stronger end on one case and my adversary is probably gonna be on the stronger end on another case. So we may say, hey, help me out here. Whether it's in getting me a better number than you might normally or making me look good or sticking something into evidence. There's a reason we need to be nice to each other. And I know that there are a lot of jerks in our profession. And I have friends who are on the defense side who tell me, I can't believe this plaintiff's lawyer is being so rude to me and so mean. And then they're asking me to help get the case settled, right? Don't do that. Don't be that person. Be nice. You can be nice and say, listen, I'm sorry I can't stick to that. I, it's reasonable for you to ask. I'd love to be able to help, but there's no way. It doesn't help my client at all. It actually would hurt my client. I just can't do it on this one, you know, if I can help you out in another way. But the reason I say this is a lot of my adversaries, you know, if I serve them all the medical bills, I'll say, can we stip to this? Can you stip that this is a certified copy that I just gave you? This is what I'm looking to put into evidence. You see it's certified, do, or do you need me to subpoena it? Um, you know, is there a reason you need to break chops just to make me subpoena it and get it there? Um, and again, a lot of it'll be your adversary. Um, I have some defense lawyers who say, you know, my insurance carrier won't agree to anything. You've got to just subpoena it. Um, some will say, sure, man, I'll step to it. No problem. Uh, I try and step out as much as possible with my adversaries on everything before trial. Stipulate to medical records, stipulate to what's going into evidence. Um, before trial, during trial, I lean over, hey man, can we stipulate to put this in? Are you gonna give me a hard time? You have any problem? Because it's gonna come right back. You know, my adversary popped up with a photograph, you know, in my last trial and he was a good guy. I really liked uh, my adversary. I, I blocked out his name because I don't like to, you know, name names, but um, my adversary from the firm, uh, whose name is there in the Amador trial, he was a good guy, a good lawyer, and he was just trying to do his job and taking his marching orders. And, um, and I wasn't going to give him a hard time. So he showed up. He's like, hey, I've got this photograph. I don't know if you saw it before, but um, I'd like to put it in my case in chief, you know, and I take a look at it. I'm like, sure, man, it's not a problem. Put it in, you know. So and if it was a really bad one, you're like, dude, you're just showing this to me now. Come on. You know, I can't agree to that. So the point is, be, be decent to your adversary. Um, Put yourself in that person's position. Remember, whether you're plaintiff or defendant, we each are just trying to do our job. We're trying to look good for our client, whether it's a plaintiff or defendant. And so, you know, if you're running into a hard time, whether you're a defense lawyer or a plaintiff's lawyer, reach out and be honest, you know, speak lawyer to lawyer. You know, things are going to go a lot better that way for you throughout the entirety of the case uh, than at the end. And then you don't have to worry about, frankly, a lot of this nonsense uh, with which statute says when you got to serve this and when you do that. And maybe that's why I haven't been stuck. Uh, I've never been called out that I didn't comply with anything because I follow the rules of serving disclosure on things I want to use. I follow my philosophy of being good to my adversary, of reaching out, really getting on the phone, having some communication. If you're gearing up for trial, find out who's gonna try the case, all right? If it's 
Sometimes you have two associates working up the file until it gets ready for trial. Sometimes you have the partner who's going to try the case on one side and maybe a partner and associate on the other side working it up, but who's not going to be the trial attorney. Um, so when you get closer, I always ask the lawyer I've been dealing with, hey, are you going to be the trial lawyer on this case? They'll say, no, no, that's going to be so-and-so. He tries all these cases. No, that'll be so-and-so. This is her file. She'll be trying it. I'll say, great. Um, you know, tell her or tell him I'm going to reach out because uh, I'm going to be trying the case. I want to go over some stuff. So I'll send an email. Hey, when's a good time for a chat? I want to touch base on the case. You know, have issues that you may have or issues you don't. You know, make that contact. Hey, I'm pretty cool about things. I like to step stuff out. You know, do you have any issues? What do you want? And they may say, oh, I just got this file. My associate should have done this deposition and didn't do it. You know, I, we're probably not to trial for another two months. You know, would you give me that deposition? I think it's really important. And so I'll look at it and I'll see if it's a witness that I think could hurt me. And, it, uh, you know, it, that I really don't want to give them that deposition. I may object if I'm entitled to, uh, but if it's not a big deal and it's really not going to hurt me and it can go a long way and help establish a rapport, then yeah, you work it out. So I really encourage that. Um, and that's something that I didn't talk about in the first hour. So I'm glad you stayed on for this Q&A, but it continues this theme that I have. Uh, I've been re reiterating really two things, and I guess it's three now. Inform the client, always inform your client about everything. Secondly, prepare, prepare, prepare. And thirdly, be a decent lawyer to your adversary. Uh, open up chains of communication, return phone calls, return emails, uh, cooperate, communicate. Even if you can't help them out or her out and can't, don't have an answer, then send an email. Hey, I got your message. You know what? I'm sorry. I'm trying to get an answer. I don't have it yet. Or, hey, I'm totally swamped. Got your message. I'm trying to get out from under. I promise I'll get in touch with you next week. Shoot me another line next week as a reminder. You know, we're all busy. We can all get that. But to blow someone off, I hate getting blown off. And I still get blown off every day of the week by adversaries, by insurance carriers. You know, just get back to me. So if we as a community can fix that, can communicate more, um, that'll go a long way to not worrying as much about statutes and compliance and more about getting each other what we need and being ready to rock and roll, you know, when it comes time to do so. Um, all right, so um, how early in a case do I start to look at the PJI? I mentioned that earlier, that'll be the last thing I'll address really early on, especially, um, you know, a lot of cases I've handled a lot, uh, uh, unless it's an unusual case, I may not need to look at it until I get a little further into the case. Uh, if I really want to lock in a witness with certain phrase words, I'll make sure I look at the PJ. I definitely look at it when I'm gearing up and get my trial file together. If it's a different type of case, um, let's say it's one I don't handle as frequently, you know, if it's a spe specific type of product liability case or fire case, or uh, you know, just something out of the ordinary, um, I will look at the PJI, I'll see if it's been updated, I'll see if the language has changed, um, and I'll make sure that uh, I'm preparing my case the appropriate way. So the earlier the better when it comes to looking at the PJI. So that's it, I'm gonna let Michelle wrap this up for us. I thank you all so much for joining me. I hope you found something uh, of value uh, during the CLE and the Q&A. And uh, next series, next part actually is gonna be part six six on Wednesday, June 2nd. We're going to talk about the trial. Um, I'm not going to be able to get into, you know, how to do everything. Uh, I do have some trial skills specific uh, on my podcast you can look for. Uh, I recommend you do that. I have one on opening statements, one on cross-examination. Uh, there will be future series I'm going to do with the Academy like this, specifically on the anatomy of trial. We'll do a whole hour on every single part of it. So next part, I'm going to talk about what it's like when you show up to try a case. What goes on, jury selection, meeting the judge, starting things up, going through the trial, uh, you know, going through everything up until what you need to do when a jury comes in, renders a verdict, and what happens if it goes your way or doesn't go your way. So I'm looking forward to talking about that. I thank you. I encourage you again to visit uh, and listen to my podcast at thementoresq.com. I encourage you to reach out to me, call me, email me about anything, anything and everything. I love to meet you. Workshop cases talk about settlement values, strategy, racing cars, whatever it may be. And um, lastly, if you are listening to the podcast, please like it, share it, send the word around. Uh, and um, I look forward to you all in the next one. Thank you again. Awesome. Thank you so much, Andrew. Another one down. Five out of seven, two more to go.